Tonight, it's an MSU TV special, one on one with Kentucky Lieutenant Governor candidate Janine Hampton. Tell me a little bit about what made you want to get into politics. And well, I, I think as a kid, even, I had, a, I, sh I had an unnatural interest in the world around me. In the part that I just read, it talks about how you have both improved efficiency and accountability in the private sector. Can you explain what those instances or accomplishments in the private sector have been? A lot of people are here will read that or see that and they'll hear that part where it says we'll cut the governor's administrative staff by at least 20 percent mm -hmm. and they'll think they want to cut jobs. Is that the case with that? Well in a way it is. Have any state GOP leaders come out to publicly endorse the campaign yet? I what are you all doing to gain as much of that, that undecided number and is, or voters who have voted, who were polled say they would vote for another person? What are you doing to say, hey, we're the right choice for Kentucky, not these guys? And now, here's Chad Hedrick. Good evening, and welcome to MSU TV Presents One on One with Janine Hampton. I'm Chad Hedrick. Tonight, an exclusive sit-down interview with Lieutenant Governor candidate Janine Hampton. She's running with Louisville businessman Matt Bevan for the Republican gubernatorial race. She was in Moorhead just last week for a GOP meeting, but I had the opportunity to sit down with her before the meeting to discuss everything from the government to education reform to her past in politics and growing up in Detroit, Michigan. The campaign trail is heating up across the bluegrass in the race for governor. With the May 19th primary for both the Republican and Democrat tickets just weeks away, every town hall, rally, and sign holding session counts for the Matt Bevan campaign. The March bluegrass poll showed Bevan tied for second place with James Comer amongst likely to vote Republicans, trailing frontrunner Hal Heiner by eight points. With any campaign comes attack ads with a Hal Heiner support group's ad against the Bevan campaign being pulled from NBC affiliate WLEX Airwaves. Tonight, a sit-down one-on-one with Matt Bevan's running mate, Janine Hampton, who talks the campaign's plans for a better Kentucky. Coming up... So, and I'm still learning. I, I believe in ongoing, continual improvement, so there's always something new uh -huh. uh, to learn. So. It never gets old, huh? Nope. It kind of makes you want to... Break into song? Yup. I love the sunset. I love Eagle Lake. I love the forest. I love when eagles play. I love the campus! And all its sights and sounds. boom de yada boom de yada boom de yada boom de yada I love philosophy. We love diversity. I love English. And all its weird words. I love the music. And all its melodies. Boom de yada boom de yada boom de yada boom de yada I love fraternities. I love sororities. I love to draw things. And all the athletes. I love Moorhead. It's such a pretty place. Boom de yada 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 boom de Lord, what fools these mortals be. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? I have always depended on the kindness of strangers.
So first, at, let our viewers get to know you a little bit and just tell us about your childhood and growing up in, in Detroit. Oh, okay. Well, um, I am from, from Detroit. I'm one of uh, th three girls, four girls, I should <laughs> say. And uh, um, my parents divorced when I was seven. So in essence, my mom found herself, you know, single mom raising uh, four girls in inner city Detroit, and we all should have ended up statistics, you know, mm -hmm. the unwed um, mothers and drop out, high school dropouts, but we didn't. In fact, um, all four of us are first generation college. Oh, wow. So um, I will tell you, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm conservative, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that, and I'm, asked, I'm often asked, why am I conservative? And uh, that, goes, that does go back to my childhood, and there's roots there. I can see the roots, and um, um, when I was a kid, there was tremendous pressure from my peers, you mm -hmm. know, other kids to fail. You know, these, these kids questioned my good grades, they questioned my, um, my reading skills, they even questioned my music, uh, you know, because I like to listen to things other than R&B, I, I love British rock. And I just remember uh, asking myself in my head, uh, at what point do I get to just be Janine and, you know, with her own likes and dislikes? And in a way, what I was asking was, at what point do I get to define um, happiness as I see it? So, you know, there's the seeds of being a constitutionalist in there. And so I ended up just pushing, uh, just actually doubling down on my books and studying. And I ended up um, working my way through college, earning an, an industrial engineering degree in Detroit. I went on to serve seven years in the Air Force, including Desert Storm. And um, after that, I spent almost 20 years in the, cor in the corrugated box industry, mm -hmm. which might sound kind of boring, but really it's <laughs> not. Because uh, if you, especially if you love manufacturing like I do, I uh, started out as a uh, supervisor out on the floor, production floor, and uh, moved to quality management. I ran a plant and I moved to sales and uh, earned an MBA from the University of Rochester. So, and I'm still learning. I, I believe in ongoing, continual improvement. So there's always something new uh, uh -huh. to learn. So. so tell me a little bit about what made you want to get into politics. And well, I, I think as a kid even, I had, a, I, sh I had an unnatural interest in the world around me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember I watched the news as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't always understand everything I watched, I saw, but um, I watched the news. Um, I could at least tell you when I was a kid who our mayor was, uh, when most people didn't even know that much. And uh, I just saw a, I just, and see, see even now, uh, you know, you realize that the, the people who run our, our, our cities, our counties, our state, and even our country, um, most people don't even give too much thought as to uh, who they vote for and why they vote for those people. And uh, I've just come to realize that it's really important to choose to uh, the right people. Detroit offers a lot of lessons in what not to do. Uh, that, I, you know, I moved away, even though I moved away in 1985 from Detroit, uh, I still kept track of what was going on because I had relatives there and uh, I can tell you it's bankruptcy did not have to happen so um, I'm you know I'm running for lieutenant governor with Matt because uh, well one thing he asked me uh, but the other thing is I think that uh, I believe that Matt brings so much to the party and I think I do too as lieutenant governor so you talked about how Matt asked you to join his campaign. How did he approach you and start this conversation with you? <laughs> he, he actually, he called and he uh, started out under the guise of asking me about uh, my campaign last year. I ran last year for Kentucky State Rep mm -hmm. in Bowling Green and, um, and didn't win. I uh, ran against a 38 year incumbent. It was my first time running ever. Uh, and I did, 37% was not a bad um, yeah. uh, result for a first timer. And so he just started out by asking me what my feelings were on running again, and uh, which several people have been asking me if I was gonna run again. And, um, and somewhere in the course of the conversation, he asked me to, if I would be his running mate and uh, I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that when you, from running for state representative, has that helped you in this race, in this campaign, to know this is what worked, this is what didn't work? It definitely, uh, definitely helped. Uh, 
the, the campaign, that campaign last year was more of a do-it-yourself campaign. Um, I didn't have hardly any help except for the last four months. And um, I, uh, so I did all the data analysis, the precinct analysis myself. I did the, I wrote my own mailers. I wrote uh, radio ads, which was really fun. I wrote the one TV ad. Uh, and so just, um, you know, I went door to door and it was more of a hands-on affair, but it, it, it really did. Uh, and then just the whole process of meeting voters and mm -hmm. talking to voters and talking to people whose ideas are 180 degrees from your own was really helpful. Mm -hmm. so. I want to talk briefly about your military service in the Air Force that you mentioned earlier. Um, is First of all, just tell me about serving in the Air Force and okay. serving your country. Okay, I, uh, I, joined, I joined as an officer since I went in with a degree, and I was a computer systems officer. And that meant I, I programmed, I did programming, I um, did some hardware acquisition, and uh, uh, tested software. And the, the most exciting job I had was testing software, AWACS software, which you've, mm -hmm. I, think, I think you've seen the uh, even if, even if you didn't know what it's called, but it's a big jet with a dome on top is what mm -hmm. it is. And it's an airborne radar platform. And I was really excited when I got the assignment because um, uh, it was one of the few jobs where non-pilots get to fly with crews. Mm -hmm. So I was excited about that. Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything from your experience from serving in the Air Force and especially Desert Storm that, that you feel may be beneficial or something that will help the campaign? At all. I think the, I th you know, one of, I learned many lessons, first of all, from serving in the military. It's my first time away from home, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, being out of Detroit. And uh, uh, the one thing I came, one thing I, that I really truly came to appreciate is working with people, different people from all over the country, you know, different, different accents, different customs, different colors, you know, whatever. And you have to learn to work with those people because the Air Force is focused on its mission. And then that breaks down to whatever mission your unit is assigned. And so you quickly learn that your differences don't matter. You know, you, your part, your little part of the, of the puzzle is what matters and all that goes into accomplishing the mission. And I carry that with me even into the private sector. And it's easy to, you know, shear away the fluff and it's easy to solve problems when you're solely focused on the mission and you learn to treat other people the way you would want to be treated mm -hmm. because in the end you all have to get the job done and that's what matters. Coming up. A lot of people are here will read that or see that and they'll hear that part where it says we'll cut the governor's administrative staff by at least 20 percent mm -hmm. and they'll think they want to cut jobs. Is that the case with that? Well, in a way it is. Hello, I'm Eric Thomas, director of the Star Theater here at Moorhead State University. And I'd like to invite you to come out and join us for some of the great programs we offer in the Star Theater. Our programs are both educational with planetarium programs and entertaining with laser shows that feature artists such as Elton John all the way out to Metallica. So come join us at the Star Theater located in the Space Science Center here on the campus of Moorhead State University. And if you've got questions, go online to moorheadstate.edu slash star theater.
I want to start going bit by bit of the, on the issues page of mattbevin.com. Okay. It, there, like I said, there's a whole page about issues and topics in Kentucky that the campaign feels needs addressed or revised. Mm -hmm. I first want to start with the size of the government. On the, the website it says, quote, our nation was founded on a bedrock of individual liberty, limited government, and constitutional principles. Mm -hmm. Blow to government is not unique to the federal level. We need to shrink the size of government at the state level in Kentucky through efforts that remove redundancy and waste in every department. As governor, Matt will dedicate one senior member of his staff whose sole job will be to find and eliminate waste and improve efficiencies in state government. Our plan will cut the governor's administrative staff by at least 20% compared to the current administration, improving efficiency and accountability, just as Janine and I have done in the private sector. This will be the model for every other department and state government to emulate. A lot of people are here will read that or see that, and they'll hear that part where it says, we'll cut the governor's administrative staff by at least 20%, mm -hmm. and they'll think they want to cut jobs. Is that the case with that? Well, in a way it is. The, you know, the working for the government should really never be the a career, if, if, you're, if you're going to, to government service, especially in a, an elected uh, position. Um, but Matt has looked at it and has determined that there's a large degree of redundancy and waste. And so in those cases, um, then certainly there's no harm in streamlining uh, uh, the, the offices so that, um, so that our government is, is, is runs more lean. And, and really, what, we're, what he's saying is, in, in a certain way, is that, you know, we, we are called to be good stewards of, of our own money, our own resources, but especially when you're in a position as, like, governor, you're, you're doubly called to be a good steward of the people's resources. And if that means that some positions have to be combined or eliminated, then you know it's it's unfortunate if if you know you, you never want anybody to lose their job. But uh, hopefully, if we do the right things and make Kentucky attractive to businesses, then there will be plenty of opportunity for those folks to to work. So now you have mentioned the redundancies. Are there certain positions or titles that you feel that the campaign feels? aren't really necessary? I don't know that Matt has looked that specifically at it um, at this point, mm -hmm. but um, he knows from just the process where he goes in and buys distressed companies that there's, that you always find redundancy. When you, when usually when you find a company in distress, they're not doing something as well as they could be doing it. And certainly Kentucky is a, is a state in distress. And so we know we'll find, I mean, we, we just know we'll find uh, some redundancies uh, or opportunities where we can improve okay. uh, operations. In the part that I just read, it talks about how you have both improved effic efficiency and accountability in the private sector. Can you explain what those instances or accomplishments in the private sector have been? Well, I could talk about, um, I could talk about my own. Yeah. Uh, when I worked in the corrugated box industry, uh, and actually, the first job I had in the corrugated box industry, I, I was a machine supervisor out on the floor, and you're responsible for a crew and this very large, you know, hot, noisy machine that makes corrugated sheets. And so you're always looking for how to make that operation better because the, the, the more product you can create and the faster you can create it, then uh, the better off the entire plant is and ultimately the better off the entire company is. So. Um, I believe I'm, I'm trying to. I mean, you're, you're asking me to go back over 20 <laughs> years. This is, this goes back to 1993 when I first came in. But uh, I, I came in with an eye. I, I questioned everything uh, mm -hmm. when I worked there. You know, why do we do it this way? Why not do it that way? Um, and I can remember helping uh, my crew uh, focus on on uh, on reducing waste. Uh, you know the. Um, you just you need to tour a box plant uh, so you can see the the production. But um, basically, you have a you have giant rolls of paper from which you you are producing sheets of corrugated, and you and there's always some waste, but you want that waste to be minimal, minimal. as minimal as possible. And so we focused on doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to transition to education, okay. which is especially here on a campus is very important. Mm -hmm. um, 
Again, the website says, as federal overreach in our education system has grown, positive outcomes have diminished. We, have, we need to end the monopoly that exists in Kentucky's school system by supporting school choice and school vouchers. It's time to stop Common Core and its one-size-fits-all approach. Instead, let's empower local school boards, local principals, and local teachers mm -hmm. to make the decisions that are best for their students and, most importantly, empower parents over bureaucrats. So do you, do you the campaign, do you think schools in Kentucky have now drifted from their sole purpose and goal to, is to benefit students and getting them ready for the next grade level or life, and now they're more concerned with getting high test scores? I, I think they have drifted from making, from being student focused. Um, and, and it's not just uh, the testing. Uh, I attended school board meetings in Warren County and uh, a couple of times they gave pre presentations about the number of students on the paid lunches and mm -hmm. breakfasts and they were proud that that number was increasing and they I heard more discussion on that instead of more just I in fact I heard little discussion on actually educating the kids so but on the on the uh, common core you know Kentucky as you know was the first state to bring common core in and it came with promises of money you know and which of course federal dollars always come with strings mm -hmm. and um, and I just think that one of the reasons we were so quick to to latch onto that system is because we are a state in distress. You know, when your when your household's in financial trouble, uh, you can either do the things that you need to do to increase your income. You know, maybe you go to school, maybe you go look for a better job, or you know, if you're in dist in, in distress, you may latch on to uh, uh, I won't say get get rich quick schemes but you may you may do make some desperate mm -hmm. decisions and I think Common Core was a desperate decision now I've been told that it was better than the system that it replaced but that for me that's not good enough okay. I think we should have benchmarked on the best in the nation we should have and, and brought that in because I think Kentucky's kids deserve that and I know since uh, for me especially education was key to me leaving Detroit and the madness that was in Detroit and and succeeding throughout my life so I want the kids in Kentucky to have that opportunity okay by ending this common core setup will this give the school systems control of what the students are taught or will there be a new plan that's put in place by the Bevan administration what we would look for I mean and obviously we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't uh, repeal it until we have found something and so it, it would be replaced with something and that system uh, ideally will return control of the school systems to the to the local authorities where I believe it belongs uh, and and also uh, pa uh, parents and teachers and superintendents because right now common core most of that authority is at the federal level mm -hmm. and uh, and I, it's I just I think that's bad for Kentucky. Do you worry though if the schools have control and you know some school systems may not have the same ideas or goals as other school systems that students in school system A may be a little bit more prepared or maybe even less prepared than students in school system B for when they go to college maybe and they'll they'll be out of balance. Well, one one reason I don't worry about that so much uh, what we one of the things Matt and I would like to see, we would like to see the school, the dollars follow the child. So if the, if the uh, parents want to send them to, you know, whether they want to homeschool or, or do charter schools. Um, and what that does is it injects a level of competition because now parents are searching for the best place to send their kids. And they're simply not going to send their, their, ch their children to a, you know, the, the worst schools. And, mm -hmm. and that, that would create pressure competitive market-driven pressure for those schools to improve and I, and I hope that parents would really I, I think it almost forces parents to play a more um, more uh, a, a larger role in their in their in their school or, or in their uh, children's education because I think that may that element may be lacking a little bit now also I know you pro you can't speak for mr. Bevan directly but mm -hmm. funding for the arts programs nationwide really in, in Kentucky has slowly been getting cut away mm -hmm. and that money's being put towards other things 
Is there a plan or has an idea been brought up at least to get more funding for the arts for students? Well, we have not been discussing uh, arts funding and, and I, you know, when, when your house is in distress, mm -hmm. I think arts funding is, takes a lower priority. Mm -hmm. But here's the, here's the beauty of, of the plan that Matt has, has uh, devised. When you focus on making Kentucky more, a, you know, a more attractive uh, state to do business in, and ideally that will ex ex bring more businesses in, more people in, expand our tax base, then that money with the arts comes with that. You know, when you have more uh, disposable income in your household, mm -hmm. then you're more likely to spend more on cable and other, other entertainment yeah. type things. And so it goes in the state too. So I think the money will come. I think the money for that will come. Coming up. You know, I know the, the president lauded uh, the Connect system because ours was one of the few websites that actually worked in the country. <laughs> Playful Young Art Gallery, located in the center of campus, offers a wide variety of art pieces from various contemporary artists in America. Exhibitions rotate approximately once a month and also host art pieces created by Moorhead State University students, allowing art majors to experience the learning process of showcasing their art. Playful Young Art Gallery, come on over today and be inspired by aspiring MSU artists. I, we're going to transition to health care reform. Okay. Mr. Bevan has talked about how health care reform begins by disbanding uh, Connect, mm -hmm. which is basically the Kentucky version of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. What are the flaws that you see in Connect, and what, if anything, would replace it? Well, Connect, you know, I know the, the president lauded uh, the Connect system because ours was one of the few websites that actually worked in the country. <laughs> but 80% um, of Connect enrollees are subsidized. And what that, what that means is, in essence, we spend over $400 million to enroll people on an existing system. It's Medicaid, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's welfare, it's what it is. And so the Connect system is, is a duplicate of the federal exchange. And of course, the, again, the Connect system came with dollars and that money runs out at the end of 2016. And Kentucky, has to, Kentucky will, foot, will have to foot the, the, the whole bill and it's money we don't have. But, and, but especially because the system is just uh, a duplicate basically of the federal system, there's really no need for Kentucky to to eat that expense. And so uh, I know there's some are, are characterizing what Matt is saying as we just want to throw people off of, off of mm -hmm. um, you know, their system on day one. And that's not true. I mean, there's, there'd be a transition. But the tran transition would have to happen before the end of 2016 uh, because that's when that money runs out. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we would replace it with that. And then in the meantime, that will give us a chance to build a true market-driven system the way the, the health care system should have been approached. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about the energy sector and coal because okay. this is Eastern Kentucky this and this, this is coal country. Mm -hmm. 
job security and job creation in, is crucial to Kentucky, mm -hmm. and especially here in coal country. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be this war with the EPA on the coal industry. Mm -hmm. What is the campaign's plan to save and protect the coal industry here in Kentucky? Well, for starters, uh, and, and Matt is very well aware of, of the EPAs, and the, the EPA is not only cracking down on coal, they're, they're extending their tentacles into um, you know what they're calling waterways. If you have a puddle on your mm -hmm. on your property, they can they can define that as a waterway and and thus gain control of what you do on your private property. It's it's almost a way of of uh, restricting private property rights. Uh, so Matt will push back against uh, EPA regulations because many of these regulations are not laws, and the 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 states always have the option of the Tenth Amendment, asserting states' rights. Now, most of them don't do that because, again, federal dollars, they need the money, they want the money, and that money always comes to the strings. I can't, I can't say that enough. Yeah. Uh, but Matt is committed to pushing back against federal encroachment where he can. And, uh, and the, you know, we'll do what we can to fight the, uh, the uh, Obama's war on coal, uh, whatever we can do. and. Um, it, you know, it may be a long fight, and we know in the meantime there's people in, in eastern Kentucky without jobs. Um, one of the things we would like to do is focus on maybe, you know, entrepreneurial uh, solutions to where, you know, we get more people becoming entrepreneurs of some sort. Uh, uh, but it's, it's a hard question, it really is, because we understand that the, you know, there's a, there's a, a uh, the unemployment is very high in eastern Kentucky mm -hmm. and uh, and options are limited too in, for employment in eastern Kentucky so okay tell me a little bit about what the current tax plan for Kentucky is and what flaws the Bevan Hampton campaign sees in it and the changes that you hope to make in Kentucky well Matt is looking at uh, the, the tax situation from both the business angle and the personal angle Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had lunch a, a, a while back with a friend of his or an acquaintance and this gentleman had moved his business to Indiana because he said it was easier to do business in Indiana than in Kentucky. And so it's a combination of, of regulations uh, and the tax rates, the corporate tax rates aren't helpful uh, in Kentucky, uh, especially when you're surrounded by states where it is easier to do business. Tennessee, uh, for example, um, and, but also the personal tax rate. Tennessee, again, you know, people will move to Tennessee because they don't have a state tax. Uh, and that's very attractive. You know, they're luring retirees, for example, and it will be really nice. I think Eastern Kentucky is beautiful. I think it's, there are some options here for retirees, uh, you know, to settle down. Uh, but, you know, you, we've got to make it worth their while. And so we, we're, we will look very closely at the, uh, the tax rates on, on the corporate and the personal side to try to make the, the state more attractive. Coming up. Are there mm -hmm. things you want to bring to the table to bring gender and racial equality to first Kentucky and then make, hopefully nationwide? Well, the, well, first of all, the premise of your question assumes that there is inequality across the board mm -hmm. on, on racial and gender fronts. And I'm not so sure I agree with that.
board, what fools these mortals be. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. Hello, I'm Eric Thomas, director of the Star Theater here at Moorhead State University. And I'd like to invite you to come out and join us for some of the great programs we offer in the Star Theater. Our programs are both educational with planetarium programs and entertaining with laser shows that feature artists such as Elton John all the way out to Metallica. So come join us at the Star Theater located in the Space Science Center here on the campus of Moorhead State University. And if you've got questions, go online to moorheadstate.edu slash star theater. I want to get in, you know, we're getting very close to the primary. Mm -hmm. um, I first want to talk about, as an, an African-American woman in this race, mm -hmm. and especially and racial and gender equality is a very hot topic nationwide. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you hope to bring to the table? You all get, let's say you get elected, you're our new governor, lieutenant governor. Are mm -hmm. there things you want to bring to the table to bring gender and racial equality to first Kentucky and then make hopefully nationwide? Well, the, well, first of all, the premise of your question assumes that there is inequality across the board mm -hmm. on, on racial and gender fronts. And I'm not so sure I agree with that. Okay. I, think, I think sometimes that is a perception that maybe the left wants to build to keep us at each other mm -hmm. and keep, keep, frankly, to keep voters from voting conservative because we get a bad rap as, you know, we're, we don't like equality or, or whatever it is. Um, I, I will tell you that I have found throughout my career, uh, first of all, I never really focus on my, either my gender or my race. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just, I'm Janine. I'm just Janine, and I and I can tell you when I was looking for you know opportunities in in the private sector, you know when I worked in the in the military, there were times when I actually was the first you know whatever you name first black person to be to work at a plant, uh, first and I did, which I didn't never occurred to me till somebody said that, uh, or the first uh, female supervisor out on the floor. You know, and I just say, well, you know, so what? I'm again because I'm mission focused. Mm -hmm. None of that. You don't focus on. All I, the I I really I honestly don't. I really don't. And I, and I think um, I I truly believe that the the left does what they can to. I, I mean, we're already seeing it in, in Hillary Clinton's campaign. Mm -hmm. She's starting with this pay inequality um, meme again. And, uh, and actually I heard some numbers, uh, <laughs> I heard some numbers which uh, say otherwise. Mm -hmm. It actually, it said up to a certain age, women actually out earn men by 8%. Oh wow. Until they get to, till they reach childbearing years. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and actually, and women actually earn more uh, degrees than men do uh, for, for some reason. Uh, but they never, they never tell you that. So I would just, what I, I tell you what I hope to bring as, as Lieutenant Governor, um, I, I really would like to use my story, my success story as an example uh -huh. to, to people who are, who are struggling, to people who are jobless, to people who think they cannot, uh, cannot achieve or even pursue the American dream. I ran into some of those folks last year. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, you can. You really can. And there's, there's, more, there's more tools now than I had in the 70s when I first started my career, the 1970s. There, there are more, there's more information at your fingertips. There's more options you can, you can study, you can study uh, online. You don't even have to leave your living room. Mm -hmm. And just, just wonderful options. You know, here at this school, there's some, you know, I was, I was looking at the college online and and uh, there for a second, I, was, I you know, I almost I was thinking about enrolling in some things, but uh, but there's there's so many options available, and even even in non-traditional studies, um, uh, welders are in uh, in short supply right now. They can earn seventy-five thousand dollars immediately after training. So vocational uh, options, and so but I, I would like to be an example and help people focus not on their different, not on you know their 
their, their differences, mm -hmm. but on what special skills they have, because everybody's got a special skill, and sometimes we never, they never ever pursue it to find out what that is. No limitations. No limitations, yeah. Just, just have fun just and go it. find, and, and actually, I tell, I'll tell you, you know, I never planned on working in the, the box industry, but it proved interesting and it, mm -hmm. and it led to some different avenues. And, you know, if you just, if you're, if my goal was just to have always have interesting work mm -hmm. and I've never been disappointed. Coming up. Can you tell me anything about the camp, about what the campaign is doing to make sure that they have that established presence? in Eastern Kentucky, in the coal fields especially, okay. to say, hey, we're here, <coughs> we're ready to work for you, vote for us on election day. MSU is the sound. MSU is art. MSU is potential. MSU is much more. It never gets old, huh? Nope. It kind of makes you want to... Break into song? Yup. I love the sunset. I love Eagle Lake. I love the forest. I love when eagles play. And all its sights and sounds. Boom de yada, boom de yada, boom de yada, boom de yada. I love philosophy. We love diversity. I love English. And all its weird words. I love the music. And all its melodies. Boom de yada, boom de yada. Boom de yada, boom de yada. I love fraternities. I love sororities. I love to draw things. And all the athletes. I love more hats. It's such a pretty place. In the past, and especially in the last three gubernatorial elections, the Republican candidate hasn't done very well in Eastern Kentucky. Okay. Can you tell me anything about the camp, about what the campaign is doing to make sure that they have that established presence in Eastern Kentucky, in the coal fields especially, okay. to say, hey, we're here, <coughs> we're ready to work for you, vote for us on election day? Well, at, at this point in the, in the election, we are focusing on where registered Republicans are. And when you look at the electoral map, there's, there's not a lot of registered Republicans in Eastern Kentucky. Now that said, you know, that doesn't mean we're, I mean, we, in fact, we were, we were in Ashland on Saturday. So we are, we're all over the state, uh, but we're, um, 
for now, at least through May 19th, that's where we're focusing our efforts. But uh, you have to know Matt. Matt goes everywhere. Matt will talk to anyone who will vote for him. So, you know, we think we have a really good shot at winning on May 19th, and we're really looking forward to really blanketing the state between uh, May 20th and the, and the November election. Um, the March Bluegrass poll showed that Matt was tied for second. Mm -hmm. uh, second place with 20% of likely Republican voters voting for him, and 25% of those polled were still undecided. Mm -hmm. What are you all doing to gain as much of that, that undecided number and is, or voters who have voted, who were polled say they would vote for another person? What are you doing to say, hey, we're the right choice for Kentucky, not these guys? Well, that was an interesting poll because it was one of the first ones done, legitimate ones done. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that, at the point that that poll was done, was taken, Matt had done no advertising whatsoever nothing no advertising we didn't we didn't even have our flyers we had we had nothing at that point when that was taken so it's interesting that it showed him tied and of course uh, Hal Heiner had been uh, campaigning at that point for one year and had mm -hmm. been running commercials so um, so what we're doing is we're we he and I Matt and I are blanketing the state we're getting in front of, of uh, registered Republicans we and we're making the case for ourselves and um, people are hearing him uh, for the first time this year. And they're liking what they, what they hear. Uh, we have volunteers going door to door. We have volunteers making phone calls. Um, uh, we have youth. We have a Youth for Bevan program where we've, get, we've got teenagers and younger um, also going door to door as a group or uh, doing sign waving. I did some sign waving in Owensboro with some teenagers uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so we're just, we're on all fronts, we're, we're making contact we're with, at this point, registered Republicans mm -hmm. to try to get them to the polls. Um, everybody in Kentucky knows that Matt ran for senator in 2014, mm -hmm. but he lost in the primary to Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. What is he doing differently in this campaign to make sure that he gets that primary, he wins in the primary and then ultimately the main election in November? Well, I wasn't involved on his campaign mm -hmm. last year, so I, I can't speak to campaign details. Um, uh, all I can tell you is what we're doing now. You know, we have a fantastic team of people, uh, core people uh, at the helm, and, uh, and we're, you know, we're managing our volunteers, we're managing, managing our money, we're making fundraising calls, um, we're holding fundraisers, uh, and, we're, and we're really getting good response from all over the state. There's a photo on the Matt Bevan website, mattbevan.com, mm -hmm. that has you and now presidential candidate Rand Paul in it. Mm -hmm. Have any state GOP leaders come out to publicly endorse the campaign yet? I do not believe so. Um, I don't think so. Okay. And that's a reflection. Uh, Matt and I are outsiders. We are definitely, we are not career politicians. We, we're, we're probably not who Frankfurt wants. We're not who Washington wants. We're, you know, we're, we're private sector people. Uh, Matt is an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, of course he ran uh, his race last year. I ran my race last year. And we are, we are outsiders. And we, we believe that that's what Frankfurt needs. One, one of the lessons I learned from Detroit, con Detroit continually mm -hmm. elected and re-elected the wrong people. Uh, one of whom is in jail actually now. Oh. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I, that's why I, I kind of, I look closely at, you know, at what our, what our elected officials are doing or not doing and how they're doing it. And so um, I think Matt brings, he brings a fresh approach that's badly needed. In, in Frankfurt right now, and it's that at the state needs right now, and it's 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 time for a business person, but more so than that, an, an entrepreneur, uh, and somebody with turnaround experience like Matt has, you know, he he enjoys the challenge of reviving uh, distressed companies, and uh, and he could bring that to Frankfurt. Coming up, if you had to describe Matt in three words, what would they be?
Lord, what fools these mortals be. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? I have always depended on the kindness of strangers. If you had to describe Matt in three words, what would they be? Fearless, tireless, and I, I was going to say quick learner, but that's too... We'll, we'll take it. Okay, we'll that's, it. that's we'll two words. That. Okay, there you go. Um, what about yourself? Also fearless. <laughs> I don't know if I'm as tireless as Matt is. I have to keep up with him. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's energetic. Um, I am inquisitive, uh, in, which has its uses, mm -hmm. and uh, determined. determined. Mm -hmm. Primaries on May 19th, mm -hmm. just around the corner, it seems. What is the one thing you want the viewers who are going to the polls on May 19th? Mm -hmm when they see the list of candidates for the Republican Party for the governor race, why should they vote for the Bevin Hampton campaign? They should vote for Bevin Hampton because we are uniquely qualified to hit the ground running and turn, start doing the things immediately needed to turn, quickly turn Kentucky into a magnet for jobs and people. And also, Matt has, Matt is the only one in the race who has hands-on pension experience. He, he runs a pension fund. He is uniquely qualified to come in on day one and begin more in-depth analysis of our $34 billion pension shortfall and put, start putting into place a detailed plan to resolve that pension crisis. Um, because if we don't do that, it won't matter if we're a right to work state and, we're, and we think we can attract businesses that way. Some businesses will look at that debt and assume that we are on a track to failure and they, and they may still refuse to come. So the debt is probably the number one, the biggest issue that we, we face. And, uh, and, and, and Matt and I will tell you, we both live our lives uh, relatively debt free. That's just our f personal philosophies. And so that debt just hangs out there and you know, and he's and Matt's got nine kids and he he wants the kids to stay in Kentucky when they're older and find work in Kentucky. And you know, and we want that actually we want I don't I don't have my husband and I don't have kids. But we would love if all the young people would stay in Kentucky find opportunities to, you know, not stay here because you have to but stay here because you want to because it's a vibrant, fun, creative place to be. Um, maybe you have a business idea, you can build your business here and, and be nurtured. And, uh, and we want you to stay here. We want, we want people to, to come here because, you know, because it's a, it's a beautiful state and it's financially solvent and it's just a wonderful place to stay and live and, 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 and raise kids. And, and so that's what we want, this is our home. Janine Hampton, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. I appreciate it. Again, our sincere thanks to Janine Hampton for sitting down with us. It was a great honor to get to talk to her. Remember, the gubernatorial primary in Kentucky is May 19th. You can vote if you're Republican for the Bevin campaign and a host of others. And if you're a Democrat, there are a couple of others running for that race as well. The main election will be in November for the new governor of Kentucky. Again, also our thanks to the Space Science Center here on Moorhead State's campus. It seemed like a great setup for her, for her love for science and NASA. She even got a tour of this building after our interview. I also want to thank my crew for their hard work in making this interview possible, as well as the Bevan Hampton campaign. That's going to do it for us tonight. Thanks for watching.